John 20 verse 30 Jesus performed many other signs many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not recorded in this book but these say these these are written that you may believe now if you may you can choose that you may not and that's your choice that you may believe I decided that I would love to believe that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, Messiah meaning God's chosen, anointed one, the Son of God. And, are you ready? That by believing, you may have life in His name. You may have life in His name. In fact, John later writes in the very next chapter, you won't see it on the screen, Jesus, he reminds us again that Jesus did many other things as well. And if every one of them were written down, he said, the books contained in the whole world would not be able to record them. This is a portion of what Jesus did. And this was written that you can believe and that you can believe and have life. Now don't confuse life with breathing. Breathing is what you're doing now to give you life. The word for life is the word Zoe. If your name is Zoe, you will probably know that your mother and father called you Zoe and you've probably found out that your name means life. That you may have Zoe life. This is not breathing life. This is life super overflowing, abundant life to the full life. And it doesn't just mean now, it means everlasting resurrection life. That's what this life is all about today. Now listen carefully, we're going to take our seats in a moment. Would it surprise you today if I told you that this book was not written so that you can have knowledge. This book was not that so you could have religion. This book was not written so that you can have your head filled with stuff. This book would probably surprise you was not written so that you could even know the Bible. This book was written for a sole reason. That sole reason is so that you can know Jesus today. Not the Bible to know Jesus. Everything about this book points to Jesus from Genesis to Revelation. There is a red thread all the way through of His blood that died for you today. So if you will believe, you can have life. Today I pray, and we have prayed, and we're all praying, and I've prayed, today would be the day like for myself where you would believe and find life let's pray together Lord Jesus today we celebrate you because we know you if we don't then may I today believe and find life for I pray it sincerely from the bottom of my heart in the name of Jesus Amen Amen. Give somebody a high five. Take your seats this morning. Thank you so much. I want to bring to you a Easter Sunday morning message on this, our first service of the day. And the Sunday morning's message is called, Show Me the Nails. Show Me the Nails. In order to show you something from this Easter Sunday message in this, the Holy Bible, God's book, God's instruction manual, God's book of life, God's book to reveal Jesus. I want to take you to two things that happened 
back in history on this day, the very first Easter Resurrection Sunday. And so today, first of all, I want to give you some context to the first passage that we're going to read together. Under the heading today, show me the nails. Show me the nails. So first of all, we have a bunch of ladies, women, who on the first Easter Sunday morning, early in the morning, decided to believe and decided to go to the tomb, even though they still had some doubts, because they said, who will roll the stone of the tomb away for us? We're just a bunch of ladies. We're not strung like the men. Sorry, be careful, Mark, how you go there. But understandably, they were going, hey, this is a couple of tons, we're told, this stone. Who's going to roll it away? They were going to the tomb to embalm the body, or so they thought, but they had an inkling something was up because based on what Jesus had already said. So they run to the tomb early in the morning, and they get there to find that the stone had already been rolled away. And by the way, for those of you who are worried about something today, Jesus' master had already going before you to roll away the stone. And when they got there, not only had the stone been rolled away, they peeped inside and they saw there on the ledge, the shelf of the tomb where the body had been laid. The grave clothes, not thrown, not chucked, like your son's bedroom or your daughter's bedroom that looks like a bomb site, but were neatly folded. That tells me that whoever was responsible had taken time and effort to remove the clothes and to just put them in a neatly fashioned pile. As the ladies look through into the empty tomb, they get excited. Sitting on top of the tomb, is somebody they presume, it says, was the gardener of the graveyard, but was in fact an angel. And the gardener angel said to the ladies, why do you look here? Why are you looking for the living amongst the dead? This is what the angel said, he is not here, he is risen. So the ladies ran back. Notice it's all about the women. And of course, my wife said, and so they ran to tell the other guys, the disciples who had walked with him for three and a half years, who'd heard him say, this is not the end. I will rise from the dead in three days. When I die at 3 p.m. on Friday afternoon, I on the third day, on Sunday, I will be gone. Where are the men? Locked in a room. Locked in a room. Locked in what we know as the upper room. They are there, the Bible says, for fear. For fear. They were there, number one, for fear because they thought, hey, if our leader and Lord has been crucified, we are with him, therefore we are afraid we might end up on a cross ourselves. Who wouldn't run and hide and have the doors locked? But the second fear was that there was a story going around right there and then, hot off the press. The disciples have nicked the body. Let's get them. Find out where they've put the body of Jesus, making it look like the resurrection. And so we have this incredible, heartfelt, action-packed movie of Easter Sunday morning. And so we find in John chapter 20, we're going to pick it up right here. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, referring to the fact that he must have been a twin, one of the 12 was not with the disciples when Jesus came. Came where? To the upper room. You see, when Jesus came to the upper room, to them On that Easter Sunday, he walked in the locked doors, walked through the wall, 
And the first thing he said is peace. And I want you to know that whatever you are thinking, whatever you are considering about the Lord today, whatever is going on inside your believing believer system, inside of your heart, you may think your believer button's broke. But listen. The first thing he wants to say today is not get to church. It's peace. He says to you, peace. Now, you may be like the disciples in terms of your heart. You've locked your heart down. You've been hurt, injured. You have chose to believe and something puts you off. And so your heart your body's in church, but your heart's lock, stock, and barrel locked down. I ain't believing. And Jesus walks through the locked heart that you've come with. And he said, hey, peace. Peace. And Thomas wasn't there. He was having one off. Or maybe he got one on him. Like the reason you don't come to church sometimes. Oh, I got one on me. Well, bring it with you. Maybe you going to the Jerusalem Mall for the day. Come on, Easter eggs for everybody. Maybe you gone for a float down on the Dead Sea for that weekend. Or maybe Easter holidays. Didn't need to be around. But whatever it was, out of everybody that was there from the disciples, Thomas wasn't there when Jesus walked through the wall. And the first thing that Jesus said when he walked through the wall was, guys, peace, here's my hands, here's my side. Take a look, guys. John 20, let's go back there. We have seen the Lord, the disciples told him. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where that sword went into his side from what the Bible says water and blood flowed from that cross. He literally died of a broken heart. A broken heart in phys physical terms means you are, you are, blood and water is flowing out of you. And he said, they said to him, we've seen the Lord. Unless I see it for myself, unless I see the nail marks, put my finger where the nails were and put my hands into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again. Say again. Do they do nothing else apart from hide? And Thomas this time was with them. And though second time the doors were locked, a week later, Still afraid. Jesus came and stood among them and said, here we go again. Peace be with you. Whatever you're going through, peace, peace. And then he looks around the room and he's looking for one guy, Thomas. And then he said to Thomas, okay, I understand. Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand. Put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, because you now have seen me, you have believed. Blessed, the word is makarios, meaning it doesn't mean happy. It means inside happiness. Inside everything comes into its rightful place. Makarios Blessed, happy are those who have not seen and yet believe. That's me. 
I haven't seen, but I believed. You will only stop the basic scramble of life when you believe having not seen. Show me the nails. There's something very important about this that maybe we've never seen before. Why did Jesus, question, why did Jesus on two occasions say, see my hands? Here's my side. Think about it. These guys have been with him for three and a half years at least. Think about it. He's just on Friday. Now it's Sunday. He's just been beaten and blooded. He's had a crown of thorns not laid on his head, pushed on his head. He's had spikes from those crown, from that crown driven into his skull, which is going to bring about not only scarring, but blood all down his forehead. The Bible tells us that he's been beaten, senseless, that almost like unrecognizable. His face has been paled. He's beaten. He's going to be bruised. His eyes are probably almost out of his sockets. And he's Sustained wounds all over his body. He has been whipped and lashed and beaten. He's had so much done to him and his face. And everybody would have seen him on the cross. So let me ask you this question. Why is it that when he walks into the room, he has to say, guys, just for reference, here's my hands. Because if I'd have been walking with Jesus for three and a half years... I wouldn't have needed for him to verify who he was. I would have went, wow. You know what I would have said? Jesus, ah, look what you did for me. Oh, let me put something on these wounds. Ah, Jesus. The Bible said his beard, great pieces was torn from it. That would have left great gaps even from that alone. Now, friends, over the years, I've seen dead people. And every time I've seen them, I haven't had a question. Nobody's been in the room. Nobody from the family has got, I don't know whether that's your Uncle Albert. Of course it's him. He's the same looking as he was when he was alive. I've seen dead people. There is no difference apart from they're not breathing and there's a sense that their spirit has left their body. My best friend had a motorcycle accident. He was in a coma for 14 weeks. I used to go with his father every single day to the hospital to go and visit him. Nobody said, I don't know whether that's Dave, you know. Of course it's Dave. He looks the same apart from he's in a coma wrapped in bandages And out of this world, he did come round, by the way, after 14 weeks and live a life. I was asked to go to the hospital to see a guy who'd been on his way from Birmingham, on his way from work one night. He was not feeling well and he put his head out the train window. Little did he realize that three seconds later the, the train would go through a bridge. Smashed his skull to smithereens and they said, Mark, come and see him. I walked in that hospital room and I commanded death to leave the hospital. And that guy, by a sheer miracle, was obliterated by that bridge. By a sheer miracle, lived, came round. Nobody from the family, even with all those sustained injuries, went, that's him. Are you sure? I don't know whether that's him. So why is it with Jesus we have to go through, show me the nails. Why did you just go, that's his bloodied and bruised and lacerated face. That's his beard that was plucked. Everybody can see it. I'll tell you one reason why. Because Jesus was not revived. Jesus was not resuscitated. Come on, come on, Jesus. We know you're there. He wasn't resuscitated. He wasn't revived. He was resurrected. He was resurrected, friends. And you say, 
Okay, so explain to me what the difference between revival and resurrection is. Simple. You see, whenever the Bible talks about you dying and me dying, it talks about the fact that we will have a new body, a resurrected body. So when Jesus left the cross and was placed in a tomb, everybody thought he's a goner. He was, he died. He actually died. But in the meantime, in those three days, not only does he say he went down into hell to preach to everybody in prison who now hear the gospel, and he preached to those to get them out of prison, out of the chains of hell. He came back to life and he was resurrected. You see, the difference between being revived and resurrected is woo, straight and you get a brand new resurrection body. So the point is this, friends. Now, I mean, let's, let's think about this. Now, I know I'm going to humanize heaven for a moment because there's no other way of doing it because I've not been and I've heard about it and I've read about it and I've listened to those who say they've been out in and out of the body experience and, uh, and words kind of capture, so let's humanize it for a moment. It's not meant to be a joke. It's not meant to be, oh, this is pathetic, but let's just talk about it in terms while we are on this planet, what is going on here? Let's say for a minute that you've lived a long life and that your hearing is not very good. Maybe you've got a couple of deaf aids. And maybe, okay, you die. You love Jesus. And so on that day, there you are. You're going to be straight into the presence of Jesus. And so let's humanize it for a moment. You know the jokes that all gets get told about heaven. And so there you go. You go up to the pearly gates and you get called through by an angel. Come through. And you go, pardon? Big pardon? Come through. I'm really sorry. I've got, that ain't going to happen. Can you imagine heaven with deafness? It's just going to be like living in our family. My mother's 87th birthday last night. Pardon? Let's just imagine that you've lived to a good old age. Cataracts. Can't see too well. Never had the operation. And all of a sudden, whoa, you die. There you are. Peter's waiting at the gates to welcome you into the presence of the Lord. And you get there and you go, Pete? Is that you? Is that you, Pete? Yeah, because it's me. Oh, I'm really sorry I never had the operation before I got here. Imagine how stupid it sounds. Let's say you're crippled with arthritis. Let's say for the last few years of your life you've been in a wheelchair. And the day comes for you to meet Jesus. Woo! There you are, rolling up to the pearly gates. Wow! And they're coming, well, I'm humanizing it. Don't get offended. And you're there sat with your arthritic condition that's crippled you for the last 17 years of your life on this planet. And the angel there says, hang on a minute, I'm just buzzing, ring and ride. <laughs> Ambuline, your mansion's half a mile down the, spur, down the golden streets, but I'm aware you ain't going to get there. Ring and ride, it's never going to happen. You tell you, I'll tell you why. Because when you get there, you're not revived. You are resurrected. You are resurrected. You have a brand new body. There ain't going to be cancer. There ain't going to be tears. There ain't going to be death. There ain't going to be dying. Your right arthritis will be go. I might have a new head of hair when I get there. You won't recognize me. I'm going to have a blonde sweep. You are going to have everything you that bone aching condition that you've got, you're going to get brand new legs. And for those of you who've always wanted a bit of a nip and tuck, it's going to be instantaneous. Don't waste your money. Jesus is safe. And those of you who want a facelift and those of you who don't, when you get there, you're going to have the biggest smile and it ain't going to cost you nothing. You're going to be there and you're going to go, wow, look at me. Is it hardly surprising that when Jesus came back in a resurrected body, there was no scars on his head. There was no bleeding coming from his face. 
There was no bruising on his head. There was nothing to suggest I have been through what I've been through. Everything was made perfect and whole because of the resurrection. You see, people say, oh, well, the proof of the resurrection is the empty tomb. I agree. But I think there's a bigger proof of the resurrection in the fact that nobody recognized Jesus when he came back that tells me nobody went, get the smelling salts. You don't even know what those are. There used to be a guy in our church and he was always passing out. So he carried with him in his pocket a little thing, you know, Vic nasal thing that used to stick up your one nose, nostril and up the other. You don't even know what that is either, do you? It's a modern world. And he used to carry a little potent bottle of smelling salts. I remember as a, guy, as a young boy of about 12 saying, I wonder what that smells like. And one day when this guy passed out, quick, get, where's his smelling salts? And you put it under his nose, he'd go, whoa! And he'd come back. But everybody recognized him. I remember having to go with the smelling salts one day. I was as high as a kite. I mean, he knocked my shoes off. So when Jesus comes back, he has to come back with an identification mark. Because otherwise you're not going to recognize him. Because he's got a resurrected body. When he comes back, the first thing, peace, peace. Everybody, peace. Second thing, here's my hands. Oh yeah, it's you. Thanks, Jesus. Take a look at my side. There could have been nothing else that depicted that it was him from the scars on his face. They'd all gone. Friends, if you don't like this life, live it. Find Jesus. And remember this. You're going to have the whole of eternity to have the best body you've ever imagined. Oh, thank you, Jesus, for that. Isn't that going to be amazing? Now, some of you are going, I don't know whether to believe this. So let me take you to the second story this morning. Two men in history, Easter Sunday, this day, but it's the afternoon. So everything has taken place, what we've just talked about. These two men are not with the disciples, but they are believers in Jesus. They've been in Jerusalem. They've heard and seen possibly everything that has gone on. In fact, they're walking away. So it's resurrection day afternoon and everybody's talking about, he's raised, he's raised, he's raised, he's risen, he's risen. He's not there. His tomb's empty. He's not here. These two guys are walking home to a village called Emmaus. So they're on the road sauntering back home. And the Bible tells us that they're asking questions, lots of questions about the possibility of the resurrection. And then he tells us that another guy joins them. And they say to him, hey, hey how you doing? And yeah. And they said to him, uh, he said to them, what are you talking about? And they went, we're talking about all the commotion, the, the, the death of Jesus. Have you heard about him? And the resurrection, have you heard about it? And he went, what are you talking about? And they went, you are the only fella in this vicinity who hasn't heard what we're talking about. In other words, where have you been? Where have you been? You're coming from the same place, the whole town, the city is in uproar. Because this fella Jesus has disappeared. And he went, tell me more. Tell me exactly what's happening. They didn't know they were talking to Jesus himself. Now explain that. These fellas would have known him. They would have seen him. Even if not closely, they would have known what he looks like. I mean, you only have to see a person in the street from behind. You know their walk. Isn't it amazing? There's John. How do you know it's John? It is. You know it's John because John walks like this. And if he's from London, he will, I'm a Londoner. And it, sorry, getting into trouble. Isn't it amazing? You can be driving down the street. You can recognize anybody. They could have a hat on, a coat, uh, everything, and you, you know it's them. They're here. 
They're talking about Jesus to Jesus. And they don't know it's Jesus. Figure that out. Apart from what we've just said, he's in a brand new body. And the Bible verifies this when it says that people didn't recognize him. He came in a different form. You say, well, so let's read it. Luke 24. As they approached, that's the two guys and Jesus, that they didn't know was Jesus. The village to which they were going, Jesus, though they didn't know it was Jesus, continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us for it is nearly evening. The day's almost over. This is tonight, Sunday night. So he went to stay with them. And when he was at the table, he took bread and gave thanks. And he broke it in their house with their bread. And he gave it to them. Now watch what it says here. And their eyes were opened. And they recognized him. And he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? And they got up and returned to Jerusalem at once. There they found the eleven, that's the eleven disciples and those with them assembled together and saying, it's true, the Lord has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. They're sitting face to face across the dining room table. They're chatting. He's telling them about the scriptures, the Bible. And they're going, who is this fella? Who is it? There's not a scar to depict it was Jesus until this. When I start to do this, you're no, looking, no longer looking at my face. You're looking at my hands. And he... <clears throat> Sorry. They're looking at his hands and they go, It's him! Why? Show me the nails. They didn't recognize anything else. Only two things happened that day. Their hearts burned. And they saw the nails. And friends, right now, I know. Just like my tender heart at 17, I was so interested in girls, my career, my dream. Everything that a normal 17-year-old would be. I, I was struggling with stuff, temptation, everything. And then my heart warmed on Easter Sunday morning. Some of you have heard my story. Eight o'clock, Easter Sunday morning. I'm the church organist. Everybody's gathering from the whole of this town to one church, our church. I have to play the organ. I don't know Jesus. I know Bible. I know religion. I have knowledge. I'm proud that I know this Bible. There's one thing missing in Mark Birchall's life on Easter Sunday morning, 41 years ago. And as we played, as I played that song, with every church pipe organ, you'll notice there's a mirror. Like driving a car. There's a mirror. And the mirror is there so that the organist can see the congregation. He can depict, rather than keep looking over his shoulder, because the organ's normally at the front, at which it was in our church. You look through the mirror. And I played this song that I didn't know, but I'd been rehearsing it so that I could. And eight o'clock on Sunday morning, it's communion. 
And Mark is there playing for communion that he doesn't know the Jesus of the communion, but he knows the Bible and he knows knowledge and he's been to church all his life three times on the Sunday, but he, his heart is not yet warmed. And I play and the chorus to this old hymn went, mine, mine, mine. It was really difficult to remember the words. And then he went, dear Saviour, Ready for the old-fashioned language? Thou art, 40 years ago, thou art mine. And I looked through the rearview mirror to look at the oncoming traffic, the, the traffic behind. And I saw old ladies and I saw men and I saw people uh, and I saw tears streaming down their faces and I saw in the Baptist chapel where we never saw this because this was now a joint venture of everybody, all the Christians from the town. And I saw people going... And I could see that they knew something that I didn't know. And as I played mine, Saviour, dear Saviour, I know Thou art mine. And as I played that, something happened inside of me and the tears started to roll down my face. And on that Easter Sunday morning, I had what these two guys had. I had an encounter with Jesus that I never look back from and I've lived for Him for 41 years. This is my 41st year of preaching Jesus and, and it's never faded and it's never gone away. My heart's warmed. And on that day, I'll never forget it on that later that day, I had a vision and I saw the vision of the cross. And again, I couldn't stop crying. There's a reason, friends, as we draw to a close. For the nails. Show me the nails. Show me the nails. Because it was the one unique thing in history that no other man on the planet could show. And even if they could show the nails, Jesus was unique in which the soldiers pierced Him for our transgressions. You see, every other candidate, and there were hundreds every day, that was crucified, was left there and their legs would be broken. Ah! And so the nails would pull through their wrists or their hands and that's where they would left be, to be died. But the prophet 800 years before said, no broken body will be in his body. So on this unique occasion, they not only nailed his hands to kill him, but they executed him by thrusting not breaking a spear into his side from which water and blood flowed. There is a uniqueness about Jesus. Every tomb of every president of America, every king or queen of England, every so-called prophet or G-O-D that's ever lived, small G-O-D, I could take you to their grave. You can go and visit them. You can go to Mecca. You can go wherever you want and you can peep inside and you'll see thousands of pounds worth of gold and jewels and it will be everything. And you'll see the mummified body or the skeletal remains. But this unique guy, show me the nails. Show me the side. That's him. Because his tomb, friends, is not bedazzled with jewels or bones. The greatest thing about the tomb of Jesus, come on everybody, is that it's empty. There's nothing there. There's nothing there. Come on, band, join me. There's nothing there. Everybody on your feet. It's Resurrection Sunday today. Everything in heaven is made by God. Apart from one thing, there's only one man-made thing in heaven. And it's the holes in Jesus' hands. And He chose to keep them. And some of you right now are going, so what? So what? It happened? Okay, it's so what? Well, He gave His lifeblood for you. 800 years before this event ever was on the mind of a man or a woman, but was always from day one on the heart of God. In Isaiah chapter 49, we read these words. 
Can a mother forget the baby at her breast? Well, you'd think not. Or have no compassion on the child she has born? Well, the answer is apparently, yes, you can. A mother can forget the child at her breast and the person she bore. Though she may forget, I will not forget you. See, see, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Right now, they're ever before me. In heaven this morning, friends, I don't know, I don't, I cannot even think what it must be like anymore to know life without knowing Jesus, to have life just breathing, just existing without having Him. But in heaven now, 24 hours every single day, angels are worshiping at the throne of God. And as they look, they see two man-made holes in the hands. And as they see it, they say, what's that for, Jesus? And they point, and Jesus points, and He said, that reminds me of Mark. That reminds me of everybody in Champions Church this morning. The nails not only hung Him to the cross, but they are heaven's constant reminder, friends, that right here, right now, you will never be forgotten. Never ever. Right now. Right now. He did it for you. These things are written so that you may believe. You may have life in His name. This is the most serious, important, life-giving thing that we do every Sunday, but especially today. It's to give every soul here the opportunity to believe and to have life in His name. I want and would love to do that for you right now. For you to believe and to find life in His name. This is your opportunity. Show me the nails. It's got your name on it. You should have been there. That death should have been yours and mine. He took it for you. He took it for me. Is your heart burning within you? I can't save a person. I can't even convince you. But I am totally, utterly, right now, relying on the power of the Holy Spirit to touch your heart, to touch your life. Come on, everybody. Yes, yes. With every eye open, with every head looking this way, you see, if you can't be bold for Jesus in church, you ain't gonna be bold tomorrow at, at your place of work. You're gonna be scared. Do you know where Easter chickens came from? The disciples. Locked in a room. Chicken. You gonna be chicken or are you gonna find life today? You say, Mark, I believe today. I wanna find life. So if this is your first time right now of accepting Christ, God's anointed one, He's resurrected one into your heart. I'm gonna ask you on the count of three, Looking this way, not with your eyes closed, not embarrassed, not ashamed. I am not ashamed to do this and neither should be you should be ashamed to admit you want to follow Jesus in this first service. 14 people at Champions Briley Hill on Tuesday who've got nothing in life gave their life to Christ. So what about here and now? On the count of three, if it's you, 
or you've been away from God and you've lost your way and today you're coming back and saying, Jesus, take me back. And He looks for you like Thomas and said, yes, you're the fellow I'm looking for. You're the girl that I'm looking for. On the count of three, put up your hand. One, two, three. Who is it this morning that said yes to Jesus? Right there on the back row. God bless you. Who else today? Come on, that's amazing. Who else today said, hey, I want some backbone today. We're out of wishbone. God bless you. God bless you. Come on, everybody. Who else today said, yes, I'm making an announcement. I'm making a decision for Jesus. Even for one person, this is right here, right now. Let's pray this prayer that we're going to worship and we're going to and we're going to clap and we're going to shout because this is the day the Lord has made. Pray this prayer, dear Jesus. You're alive. Come into my heart. I give you my life. I now believe. Do a miracle inside of me. I turn from my sins and I turn to you. Thank you for dying for me, for raising from the dead. In Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, let's thank Jesus.